So what I'm going to talk about today is um, the topic of this book I published a few years ago, A Taste for the Beautiful. And the main question that I addressed in this book is why do animals, so many animals evolve traits that are not only beautiful to us, but beautiful to members of the other species. Now this is in, uh, this whole idea is an interesting history. So after Darwin published his great theory of natural selection in On the Origin of Species, he surveyed the courtship traits throughout much of the animal kingdom. And he suggested that many of these traits that we see do not appear to enhance survivorship, <clears throat> but if anything, are, um, are maladapted for survivorship. And this, as we'll see, this caused some very um, big problems from Darwin. But first, why, let's look at some of these traits that, um, that concern Darwin. Okay, this is a male peacock and the male peacock erects its tail and shakes it back and forth in front of the female during courtship. And both the female peacocks and most of us would find this tail very beautiful. But Darwin said that every time he saw the peacock's tail, it made him sick. So we're going to return to this um, reaction of Darwin's, but let's look at some other of these traits. This is a red bird of paradise. It's an inhabitant of Indonesia, and it's known for these long, long tail wires, they're called. And interestingly, during courtship, these tail wires seem to outline the male in the middle of a heart. This is sometimes referred to as the most beautiful bird in the world. This is the resplendent Quetzal. It's the national bird of Guatemala, and it appears on their flag's coat of arms. And again, this is the male, not the female. Another spectacularly beautiful animal is the golden-headed lion tamarind. And this is um, a primate that's found in the lowland tropical forest of Bahia, Brazil. And these monkeys live in social groups and both the males and the females care for the young. And there's almost nothing else known, of, known about, uh, about these animals, uh, except that they're endangered. Some may be close to extinction, sadly. And it's also, some people refer to this as the um, world's most beautiful primate. Now these, these are, beautiful and elaborate courtship traits can also um, be found in insects. This is the peacock spider. Its colorful display is reminiscent of the peacock and it raises its abdomen that we see here that's so beautifully colored only when it's courting females. And when it courts females, it moves its abdomen back and forth, much like the peacock um, shakes its feathers. So these traits are not um, restricted to vertebrates, even though most of the examples that I gave will be vertebrates, but they're also very common in insects. These traits can be produced in a number of different ways. And this is a, um, this is a photo of fireflies, males and females, female fireflies. Uh, there's a time-lapse photograph in the Smoky Mountains of uh, Eastern United States. And there's several species here and each species has a very specific flashing pattern. So individuals can, di can uh, discriminate one species from another species. These are guppies and guppies are known not only for the spectacular array of colors that adorn the males, but also for an incredible amount of variation. And these are examples taken from various streams in Trinidad where these guppies live. And this is only a small sample of the striking variation. 
Now, when we look at these elaborate and bright and beautiful courtship traits, what we often see is that there's sexual dimorphism, meaning that the sexes differ from one another. And these are collared lizards in the Southwestern United States. They occur uh, in the state of Texas where I am. And that's the male on the top and the female on the bottom. So Darwin surveyed a lot of these traits in a, a wide range of animals. And what did Darwin surmise from this? Well, one is that these traits, these beautiful courtship traits are usually sexually dimorphic. And they're usually much more extremely developed in males than in females. These traits can be involved in sexual combat like antlers in, um, in various, various deer species, or like the ones that we've been looking at now are involved in sexual attraction. Darwin also suggested that it's likely that these traits are uh, maladaptive for survival. They decrease the survivorship of the bearer, which in many of these cases, not all of them, but many of them are males. So how can these traits evolve then? Darwin suggested earlier in The Origin of Species that Natural selection results in the evolution of the traits that enhance survivorship. That was a very well-received theory when he proposed it, but now he's finding all these traits that challenge the theory. So he suggested another hypothesis, instead of natural selection, sexual selection. And sexual selection is variation in reproductive success, meaning the number of offsprings that you produce. That's due to variation in mating success. And Darwin posited that traits can evolve even if they hamper survivorship, as long as they more than compensate for that by increasing mating success. Now, the real controversial aspect of Darwin's theory of sexual selection is that he said, he, stated that many of these traits are being favored by female mate choice. That these elaborate and beautiful, but in a real sense, deadly traits that the males evolved to attract females are, fa are favored by female mate choice. So he suggested that in animals, it's the female more often than not is the one who gets to determine who mates. Well, we can ask, why is there this asymmetry at all between the sexes? Why is it that it's usually the males that are more elaborately adorned and the females that usually get to choose with whom they want to mate? And it, it all comes down to the difference in the size of the gamete. So what we're seeing here is a human egg and a human sperm. And what we can see is that the egg is much, much larger than the sperm. Therefore, males are able to produce many more sperm than females are able to produce eggs. So what that means is there's many, many sperm in the world competing with one another for access to a limited number of eggs. Well, the, the, since the sperm are in the males and the eggs are in the females, what that means is that males are competing amongst themselves, whether through direct combat or trying to um, influence female choices, that there's going to be a lot of variation in males, who gets to mate and who doesn't get to mate. <clears throat> now, in most species, females always get to mate. However, in, in many species, Males actually never get to mate. They die as virgins. So this leads to what we refer to as sexual conflict, the different mating strategies between males and females. So basically, the males have to compete for access to the females. But since the females can always find a male to mate, the females are now in a position to choose with whom they want to mate. 
So in many of these mating systems, the males are under selection to mate as often as they can, and the females are under selection to mate as carefully as they can. But in the 150 years since Darwin proposed this theory of sexual selection, there's, we have found a lot more variation in mating systems than uh, Darwin was aware of. And here's one very interesting exception that we found, that was found recently. So these are cave lice. They're small, small insects. And this particular species, it lives in caves in Brazil where it feeds on bat guano, bat feces. Okay, so what we see here is that one individual, that these two are mating and one individual is on top and the other individual is on the bottom. And that's what we normally see in fertile, that what you often see in fertilization where there's, um, where the animals aren't internally fertilizing one another. But here, here what we see is that it's the female that's on top and the male is on the bottom. That's not unusual, that's not, a, that is unusual, but it's not that, it wouldn't seem that important, except what we see here is that this, stru this structure here is coming from the female. So the, in this species, the females have penises and the males have vaginas. So the way they reproduce is the female inserts this organ, this penis-like organ into the male, into where the male has his sperm. And then the female sucks up the sperm through this organ and then the sperm comes into the female's body and it fertilizes the eggs. So this is, only, this is only one example of how much more variable these mating systems are uh, than Darwin suggested. Another interesting thing about, um, about Darwin's sexual selection theory is that he was roundly criticized by most of the evolutionary biologists of his time for this theory of sexual selection. And he was criticized because he was suggesting that females had an important role in determining who gets to mate. And that was really contrary to Victorian Moors of the time that assumed that males were in charge of the mating system, uh, the mating decision. So this wonderful book by the uh, historian of science, Evelyn Richards, pointed out that Darwin naturalized female choice among animals. But when Darwin was talking about humans, he went back to his old Victorian moors and suggested that it was the males that made all the important decisions in our own species. Although in other animals, he empowered females in the sense that they were the ones getting to, uh, getting to choose mates. Once again, we find that there's lots of variation there's, um, we know that there's other systems where males choose females and females compete for males. This bird is a jacana. They're polyandrous. Females have many mates and the females compete for access to the males that build and defend nests and then incubate and care for the offspring. This is a very ex interesting example here, seahorses and their close relatives, pipefish, in seahorses, it's the males that become pregnant. How that happens is the males have a brood pouch. And once the eggs are fertilized, the female takes the eggs and she inserts them into the male's brood pouch. So the, and the, the egg stays inside the male's pouch until the baby seahorses hatch out. So again, here's another example, both the seahorses and the pipefish where there's where there's what we call sexual reversal. And again, females competing for males rather than vice versa. And as we can see from the pipefish, this is the female pipefish and they're the ones that evolve these beautiful ornaments. And then of course, we know from our own species that, there, that there's mutual mate choice. So if we, if we survey 
this what we call the strength of sexual selection amongst many, many different animals. What we see on this graph, the details aren't important, but for each species, if they fall to the right of the dotted line, that means the sexual selection is mostly influencing males. If it's to the left of the dotted line, that means sexual selection is actually stronger in females. And what we see is, first of all, there's a lot of variation in how strong sexual selection is. And we, the exceptions that we see are usually, uh, many of them are with seahorses here. And again, we see sexual selection being stronger on females because now the females are in the position to mate with males. So throughout the rest of the talk, I'll be talking mostly about how, um, about males advertising for females and females choosing males. But I just wanna make it clear that even though that's the most common situation, there's lots and lots and lots of variation in the animal kingdom. Now, as I pointed out, Darwin, Wrote a, wrote a letter to this botanist, Asa Gray, and Darwin said, the sight of, sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. Now, we know that Darwin was a hypochondriac, but this particular ailment that he had was probably the result of cognitive dissonance. And like I said, this idea that natural selection is supposed to favor animals that survive long, but then they have these traits that appear to decrease their survivorship. And Darwin then in his sexual selection theory suggested that there can be a balance between these two forces. So what I wanna do is tell you a little bit about some of our research with these frogs that is a very good illustration of these, this balance. So this frog here, it's the Tungra frog, Physolemus pustulosus. And above the frog is a picture of Barrow, Colorado Island. This is an island in the middle of the Panama Canal, and it's managed by the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And that's where my students and I have um, done, done most of this work. Now, like a lot of frogs, these frogs gather in small pools of water and the males call advertising for females. Now there's about six or 7,000 species of frogs. Almost all of them call with very few exceptions. And for all of these species that call, their call is species specific. What we mean is that their call associates with them as a species. So females are able to listen to the calls and tell which, whether or not they're listening to their own males. So whether they're listening to a male who might become an appropriate mate. So we're gonna just uh, look at a little video of, uh, of one of these males calling in nature. And I do wanna point out that uh, these frogs are fairly small. They're only about 30 millimeters in length. Now from this short clip and with all the frogs calling in the background, we really don't get a, you, really wouldn't get a good idea of the structure of these calls. So we'll see it here. So this is a call that can be variably complex. The first part of the call is referred to as a whine. It sounds like this. Now males can produce only whines, but they can also add chucks to these calls. One chuck, two chuck, three chucks. They can add up to seven chucks to this call. And we'll listen to a single the, these exact calls that I'm illustrating here. Now, any male can add chucks to his call. Now, if a male's calling by himself, he'll only make the whine, but if I were to say to him, he'll respond to me, and his response will be, and if I say to him, yeah, uh, then he will respond, yeah, uh, uh. So they have this vocal, vocally complex call and they're not adding chucks all the time, but we wanted to know why did they add chucks at all? And since they're using these calls to attract females, the obvious 
hypothesis was that these chucks make the males more attractive to females. So we can answer these questions, test these hypotheses very cleanly. We collect these, um, the females in the field in Panama. They only come to the breeding site when they're ready to mate. And then in our lab in Panama, we have an acoustic chamber. We put the females in the acoustic chamber shut up the doors, we observe them under an infrared light, and then we play them calls from various number of speakers. In the, this basic experiment, we use two speakers, and the females hear, yeah, 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 and the females will go right up to one of the speakers, searching for the male that's making that call. And just to put this to scale, for the females to go from the center of this arena to the speaker, if we scale it up to our body size, they would be traveling 80 meters. So when we do this experiment, which we have done over 5,000 times now over the years, what we find is that the females are attract, more attracted to a wine chuck than they are to a wine. So both of these wines are identical, but by adding a chuck onto the male, uh, I'm sorry, onto the wine, it makes the chuck five times more attractive to the females. Now, if we think of our own species, there's lots of things that we could do, that we can do to ourselves to make ourselves a little bit more sexually attractive, but 500% more sexually attractive would just be unheard of. Okay, so now the question becomes, we know why they're making chucks, right? Because they, it makes them more attractive to females. Well, then why don't they always make chucks? Well, it suggests there might be some cost to producing a chuck. So we measured how much energy males use when they call. And they, they use a lot of energy, but it doesn't take any more energy to add a chuck onto the call. The chuck is just a little, a little burp at the end of the call. And we can't measure any increase in, uh, in metabolism when the males make a chuck. But metabolism and energetics, that's only one type of a cost, but there's another type of a cost. And I'll show you that cost now. There's a predator that hunts children of frogs by honing in on their calls. The more distinctive the call, the easier the talk. So this is the frog eating bat, trichopsirosis. It's unusual in that it eats frogs. It's very unusual in that the way it locates the frog is not only by using echolocation signals, but by listening to the bat, to the frog and homing in on it. So we can do the same kind of experiments with the bat that we do with the frog. So if we give the bat, we play the bat a wine call by itself, the bat will be attracted to the speaker sometimes landing on the speaker and kind of ripping at the top of the speaker, trying to get the frog that's inside. But if you give the bat a wine from one speaker and a wine with chucks from another speaker, they prefer the call with the chucks. So they have these same preferences that the females do, but the female is looking for a mate while the, man, the bats are looking for a meal. We also found here that um, there's these little blood sucking midges. They land on the males. They're very much like mosquitoes, although they're not, they're not mosquitoes. They land on a calling male. They crawl along on his back and they eventually come up to his nares and they crawl inside his nares where the capillaries are close to the surface. And then they suck blood out of the male's uh, capillary. So they take a blood meal. Amazingly, these insects are also attracted to the frog's call. And like the bats and like the female frogs, they prefer calls with chucks to calls without chucks. 
So this is a pretty good example now of the conflicting forces of natural selection versus sexual selection on this attractive male call. So sexual selection favors males to make more chucks. Natural selection favors males to make fewer chucks. And the way that these frogs have evolved to deal with that is to have a trait that's variably complex. They can move it more towards the sexual selection optimum or they can move it more towards the natural selection optimum. Optimum. Now, one question that evolutionary biologists have been interested in for a long time is, well, why do the females even choose males? Why do they invest all of this energy and, frankly, a lot of brain power to have these kinds of preferences? Well, there's, there are some, some um, easy solutions to that question. As I pointed out with the frog, many of these courtship traits indicate what species is presenting the trait. So there should be really strong selection on animals to mate with individuals of the same species. So we see in the bottom left here, this is a frog clasping a female salamander in exactly the same way he would clasp his own female. Now, no matter how long and how hard this male hangs on to the female, they're never going to produce fertile offspring. So there's always strong selection to be able to identify your own species. And then there's strong selection to make choices within your own species. So for instance, in many birds, uh, males contribute care to their offspring. So if the, the male's courtship traits indicate that he's going to be a good provider, then this should influence the female's choice. But we wanted to we want to talk about how the females are perceiving these traits as being quote unquote sexually beautiful. Now we know that in our own species that different individuals can have different perceptions of what is beautiful. And this is, uh, this is shown in Picasso's painting of Girl Before a Mirror. And he asks, you know, who sees the human face correctly? Is it the photographer, the mirror, or the painter? And this really echoes a point that Darwin made too. And Darwin said, when males utter sounds to please females, they would naturally employ those sounds that are sweet to the ears of the species. So Dar like Picasso, Darwin is emphasizing how important it is to understand the inner workings of our appreciations for beauty. For beauty. And, the, and Darwin said that females will have a taste for the beautiful and there should be strong selection on males to evolve traits that please this taste for the beautiful. And we suggested this idea a number of years ago called sensory exploitation. And we said that in, not in all cases, but in many cases, quarters, usually males, will evolve traits that exploit pre-existing sensory and neural and cognitive biases in females. And we'll give you an example of how this works. So this is the tungra frog on the top. Again, this, is, uh, this species is mostly in Central America, although it's found in uh, the very north of Colombia and then through these Great Plains, the Llanos of Venezuela. Below the tungra frog is a relative. This is called the Colorado frog. The Colorado frog is found on the Western side of the Andes in Ecuador, where we worked with it. Now, the tungra frog can make add these chucks to the calls, but of the other closely related species, there's only one other that can add chucks to the call, and that's the sister species, the closest relative of the tungra frog. Okay, so this is, this is what the Colorado frog sounds like. So they don't make chucks but we're able to, we can add chucks to their call. So this is the call of a, of a collar dorm to which we have added these chucks. 
from the tubular frogs. And of course, these the Colorado females have never heard anything like this. But when we give them a choice between their normal call and the newly adorned call that we synthesize for them, what we see is that the females have a preference for this complex call. So this would be an example of sensory exploitation. It suggests that with the tungra frog, when they added chucks to their call for the first time, that the females probably had some bias in their brain. And we do understand what this bias is. I don't have time to uh, get into their brains here. But we understand how the auditory system works in these frogs. And there was an untapped sensory gate that wasn't being used in the communication system until these individuals started to, um, to add these uh, chucks to their call. Now, there's an analogous example with fishes. These are, these are fishes that are common in the, in the aquarium tray. These are sword tails on the top platyfish on the bottom. There's many species of sword tails and of platyfish. All of this, this is a family tree showing their relationships. All of the sword tails are more closely related to one another and all of the platyfish are more closely related to one another. The sword tails have swords and the platyfish and guppies and other small fishes are lacking swords. So what that suggests to us very simply is that, well, if the sword must, do ev must have evolved after the platyfish and the sword tail split off from one another. So this is when the sword evolved, but what about the preference for the sword? Not surprisingly in sword tails, females prefer males with longer swords. Platyfish don't have swords, but Alex Basolo did this very simple and elegant experiment. She made plastic swords that she attached to platyfish. And then she asked the female platyfish, would you prefer to mate with a normal, typical male of your species, or would you prefer to mate with a male who has the sword, something that she had never seen before? And the answer is that she would prefer the sword. So what that means is that this preference for having a sword is present in both sword and sword tails, but it's also present in platyfish. But this preference is never elicited in nature because the male platyfish don't have swords. So this is another example of sensory exploitation. So what we see then in general is that when males evolve these beautiful traits, they're often exploiting or plugging into these aesthetic biases that the females have. So that's one, one reason why these beautiful traits evolve because uh, under the strong preference from females. Now there's another Another interesting aspect to a lot of these sexual traits that are favored by sexual selection. One way to become more attractive is not to be boring. When animals are subjected to the same stimuli again and again and again, they habituate to those stimuli. So hab habituation is really the process of becoming bored. Now there's these interesting experiments done, done with zebra finches. And the researchers played to female zebra finches, the zebra finch song with one of the syllables that repeated and repeated and repeated. And what we see here is that the number of neurons that fired in the brain and the strength of the female's attraction to those signals waned with, uh, with familiar calls, but then when a novel syllable was put in, then the females found those songs more attractive. So there seems in some cases to be selection for novelty because a lot of times these animals are, um, are prone to boredom, to habituation. And in a, a, 
a humorous experiment a number of years ago, researchers put these little hats on male zebra finches and wearing these hats actually made them sexually more attractive to females. There's some speculation as to why, but we don't really know what was going on in the female's brain, but we do know that her attractiveness to these males increased. In another experiment with guppies, once again, they raised two groups of guppies in the lab. And one group was called, merely called line A, and another was called line B. Now, when females from line A are exposed to males from line A constantly, their sexual receptivity decreases. But now if you present a female with a male from line B, all of a sudden her sexual receptivity increases. And this seems, <clears throat> as we see here, that habituation is resulting in females having preferences for these novel stimuli. And it works, it also works with the females from B. Females from line B get bored of males from line B, but will find males from line A especially attractive. Now, let's pause for a second and think about um, an animal's emotions and how it's related to its facial cues. Now, most of us can tell just by looking at a dog whether the dog is fearful here or if it's aggressive here. And we see that there's continuous variation in the traits associated with fear and with aggression. But the end point of fear is usually the dog lowering its head, putting down its ears. And for the aggressive end point, it's usually males baring their teeth. And there's sounds that go along with this. The fear endpoint, when the male, when the dog is showing that submissive behavior, it's also making sounds. And these are usually whiny sounds. And they're tonal and they're high frequency. The aggress, the calls that they make when they're baring their teeth, of course, is the growl. And the growl from the same, from the same dog, the growl will be very low frequency and it would be very noisy. And we see this association between emotion and visual cues and auditory cues across a large, a large number of mammals. So we can ask, we can flip this question around and instead of saying, the emotion causes the, the animal to make these kinds of sounds, we can ask, do the kinds of sounds we hear influence our emotions? So we know that music might soothe the savage beast, but what researchers have now shown is that music can manipulate our, um, our emotions. And this has been known for quite some time. In the 1700s, Christian Schubart produced a description of major keys in music and suggested what emotions they elicited. So not looking at all of these, but the descriptions of them are so entertaining. So if we look at F sharp minor, Schubert said, this is a gloomy key. It tugs at passion as a dog biting a dress. Resentment and discontent are its language. And if we compare that to A major, Schubert suggests that this key includes declaration of innocent love, satisfaction with one's state of affairs, hopes of seeing one's beloved again when parting, and youthful cheerfulness and trust in God. So these, this might be, these predictions might be a little specific and a little extreme, but we certainly do know that music does marshal different emotions in humans. So if we think of martial music like Wagner, you almost want to stand up and start marching when you hear that music. And that's very different than romantic music. So there was this um, interesting and entertaining study 
They wanted to know if music influenced romantic arousal in men. And it seems that the, the experimental protocol was quite simple. You give a male either, a man, either some happy music or some sad music, then you show him some pornography, and then you measure his erection and you ask him how horny he is, pretty straightforward. So this is the music that they were given. Uh, the first is from Mozart. And then the, that was one group of men heard that, and the other group of men heard barbers. So after, after each group of men experienced one or the other type of music, again, then they were, um, were instructed to watch um, a porn video and then the tubescence of the male's erection was measured. And also he filled out a questionnaire. And what the basic results were, and the results are strong, it's that the males were sexually aroused, they were more sexually aroused if they were exposed to Mozart before, as opposed to being exposed to Barber. And this, this doesn't really come as a surprise, right? Because we know that different types of music have important influences on our emotional state. What we also know though, is that our appreciation of beauty can be influenced by others in our social group. And there's a series of studies in animals referred to as mate choice copying. And I just wanna go through a study that we had done a number of years ago. And we did this study with a very unusual fish. So this is a sailfin molly. Sailfin mollies have a quote unquote normal mating system. There's males and there's females. This is an Amazon molly named after the mythical Greek tribe, which had only females. The sailfin mollies have sexual reproduction. The gamete of the male fuses with the gamete of the female, and the offspring have half the genes from the mother, half the genes from the father. The Amazon mollies reproduce by gynogenesis. So there is no fertilization. But what's interesting in this system is that the females need to acquire sperm to trigger the development of the eggs, but the sperm is not incorporated into the, uh, into the female's gamete. So the males are not getting anything, any genetic reward as it were by mating with the female because their sperm helps the female reproduce, but it doesn't carry the male's genes. So we're interested in why then the sailfin males would even mate with an Amazon molly. And we tested this hypothesis of mate choice copying. Very simple experiment. You put a female in the middle of an aquarium and you have two plates of glass and a male on the side of each place, plate of glass. Okay, female sailfin molly, a small male and a large male uh, sailfin. The females preferred the larger males. Now, what you do is you take the female and you put her back in the middle of the tank inside a glass cylinder. Now, with each of the males that you were tested, you now put in with those males an Amazon molly. The female can now see the previously unpreferred male interacting with the female Amazon. Here, this male is being stimulated by the female Amazon, but the, fe the female we tested, the focal female, can't see that there's a barrier. So now, then you remove that cylinder and you repeat the experiment. And what you see now is that the females change their choice. Now they prefer the previously less preferred male that she could observe courting. So this idea of mate choice copying has been shown many, many times in a whole variety of animals. 
And what we've also shown is that the attractiveness of the model that you introduce influences how strong this mate choice copying is. So this is an experiment um, that I did with the then graduate student, Sarah Hill. And Sarah Hill just published, last year published a really um, fun book called This Is Your Brain on Birth Control. But what, what Sarah and I did was re we repeated the same experiment. So the females preferred this male, he's slightly larger. Now in this stage, you give the preferred male an Amazon Molly and she can, the focal female can see that. But now you give this male a sailfin Molly, his own species. And we know that the males would prefer to mate with sailfins than to mate with Amazon. And then you repeat the experiment. And then what you see is, again, she switches her preference to the non-preferred male, suggesting that the female can tell the difference between the two model females here. And she realizes that this female has higher utility. So it makes this male even more attractive. So these similar experiments were done with humans. You show you show women a picture of a male and they rate the male's attractiveness. Then you show another group of women a picture of the same male with, a, with, another, with a woman and his attractiveness goes up. Then you do another experiment where you show the picture of the same male with an attractive woman and the same male with a less attractive woman and being with a more attractive woman increases his, uh, his attractiveness to women. Now, one thing, one thing that we want to ask is, did this copying behavior evolve as a specific mate choice mechanism? So, you know, we know that the brain's an important sex organ, but it does have other things on its mind. And we know that social facilitation in animals and including humans is very common. We like to copy the behavior of other individuals. I mean, we all know about the importance of peer pressure in human societies. So they did this very interesting experiment where they gave women a picture of a male and they said, rate how attractive this male is. And there's a bunch of people doing, these ex uh, doing this experiment in real time. So then the, what the subject is shown, well, okay, this is how attractive you thought you think he is. But if we average what all of the other subjects thought, they thought he was a bit more attractive than, than you did. Would you like to change your score? But you don't have to. And then the, the, the woman subject does change her score and she's influenced by what the rest of the group does. Now, in this case, she doesn't totally match what um, how attractive the other folks uh, the other folks found that image, but she, they do find they do find it more attractive than they did the first time. So what we see here then is that the subjects moved their rating by thirteen percent towards the majority opinion. Okay, so that's an example could be an example of something like matrix copying. But then they repeated the experiment, the same subjects, and they repeated this experiment with a work of art and pictures of hands. And what they found is that the subjects were still influenced by peer pressure and the degree to which they were influenced was again about 13%. So the conclusion, the conclusion then is that mate choice copying in humans, or what appears to be something like mate choice copying, might be and just one, one example of social facilitation in our species. And what they show is that this kind of peer pressure the social facilitation seems to work just as strong in making judgments about hands and about faces and about arts and about art. 
So I'm going to uh, I'm going to leave it there and just to kind of summarize, what we see is that there's all these beautiful traits throughout the animal kingdom. These traits have evolved because the more beautiful the porter is, the more likely he's going to be chosen by the chooser. And in most cases, it's attractive males being chosen by females. But beauty doesn't really reside in the trait of the male. Beauty emerges from the interaction of the female's brain with those traits. So in that sense, it's not, in these cases, beauty is not an objective quality of the trait, but it's a subjective emergent property from the interaction of the courtship trait and then how the female perceives that trait. And these are, these are you know, a couple of, a few examples that I've taken from, uh, from my recent book, but, and there are a lot, lot more other discussions in that book about the evolution of a taste for the beautiful. So I do want to thank um, some people and some organizations. We've been working with these tumor frogs for many years, and we've had many, many interns working with us in Panama, over 50 of them, and they've we could never have done the number of experiments that we did without their help. Um, most of that work was conducted in Panama at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, the scientific funding agency in the United States for these types of research is the National Science Foundation. And then we've also had some uh, financial help from my home university where I am now, uh, University of Texas. So if there's time, I would be more than happy to entertain any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for the talk. Uh, um, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with, uh, with, with some questions. So my, my first question is, <clears throat> what, what is the preference? I mean, like, um, when when we look at the uh, look at the models, for example, the 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 runaway selection and those kind of uh, modeling efforts, then uh, usually these uh, preferences are represented as as a as a single gene or something like this. But uh, when when one think about it, uh, it, it uh, doesn't seem like uh, this would be as as easy. Or in some cases, maybe yes, but in some other cases, not so. Uh, uh, what one uh, should uh, uh, should uh, imagine as as uh, being the preference in in the female's brain because the, the brain is a very complex organ. But uh, uh, so so how one could imagine those preferences that uh, drives the elaboration of of these traits? Yeah, that's a, I mean that's a very good question. Theoreticians. When they do their theoretical models, they almost always assume that there's one gene that controls the preference. And the only thing we can say about that for sure is that it's almost certainly wrong. And if you think, you know, if you could think about the previous talk, if you think about Michael's talk, in, in that case, the importance of the retina in being tuned to certain wavelengths, to certain colors is really important. And then that information in most animals uh, will be forwarded from the retina to the brain. So the retina has already done a lot of the, um, a lot of the bias in what's going to be found attractive, right? If you can't see it, if it's, not, if it's not stimulating the photopigments in the eye, then it's never going to get to the brain. In the tumor frogs, we have this, we have this worked out to some extent. They have two inner ear organs as opposed to one, and the wine matches the tuning of the one and the chuck matches the tuning of the other. And we've shown that with electrophysiology studies. And then when it goes to the brain, we've done, um, G, they're called gene expression studies. So when we play the female a call, then we sacrifice the female and we can go, we walk through the entire brain and we see where in the brain are you getting more responses to the wine chuck and the wine. 
So what we see is that in the auditory centers, the wine chucks have elicited more neural responses. The, in the decision-making part of the brain, and the, with these guys in the uh, hypothalamus, you all you see that there's more uh, activity in response to the wine chuck. Then you go up to the motor system, and you can see that the wine chuck is turning on more of these motor neurons. And with very, very preliminary results, but what we also see is that these calls also give more excitation to this dopamine reward system. And you know, dopamine is very important for uh, hedonic responses in humans, you know, and to the extremes, right? Um, gambling, uh, drug taking, overeating. So if you're to ask what the timber frog is, well, we have all of the, we know so much about these preferences and we've looked in the ears, we've looked in the brain. Can you put your finger where the female preference is? And the answer is no, right? It just cascades through the brain and has all of these effects. And what emerges from this whole cascade of neural events is the females preferring one call versus the other. And, and it's, I think the answer to your question is that it's going to be very unusual to find a single gene that's responsible for, uh, for, the, for preferences. With, with, the theoretical, uh, with the theoretical modeling, how, how one should, so, so one should take these theoretical models as an uh, like really a rough abstraction uh, because then, uh, the dynamics of, of the evolution of these traits, the, the elaboration will be very, uh, very, very complex. And uh, so how, how one should think about these elaboration events during, during the evolution, uh, because- Well, and I mean, again, it does get very complicated. One of the things that the theoretical models have shown is that if this preference, this preference might be related to other functions. So for example, um, you know, going back to, uh, to looking at things underwater from Michael's talk, we know of cases now where the female, the tuning of her eyes, the photopigment tuning is influenced by the light environment in which she has to find her prey, the males and the females. But then the males later on evolve colors that match what the female's best able to see. So what we, what we need, to, what some theoretical models now you know, have addressed is what's called, it's called pleiotropy where the genes can have different effects in different domains. So that's, you know, so that's one of the things that are going to have to be uh, incorporated. But truthfully, I think the, the, the models have, I don't want to say they've gone as far as they can, but I think they've been very important early on in instructing us as to what factors might be important. But it seems that what, where we're really going now with sexual selection and female preferences is drilling deep into the brain and trying to understand what's happening in the brain and not being as concerned with uh, which particular genes may or may not be responsible. Well, are there any other questions? Well, okay. Hello, Mr. Uh, Professor. I'm I'm um, I'm an artist, and so I'm I'll not be as precise as. as uh, Sindra, but I was just very curious about the, the, the scheme that you were showing about the as, as, as soon as this art interaction appeared as, as the other, like the, the hand and the face. Do you think you could elaborate a little bit about that? What kind of, uh, is, does it mean, did I understand it well that the, the artwork has the same kind of uh, sensory impulse as the, the hand or other uh, things or is it? Yeah. So, I mean, what, what the main point of that is, regardless of why the subject would find certain hands more attractive or certain art more attractive, the, 
the main point is that the subjects will be influenced by what other individuals say they find attractive. But in terms of a, tie, of a better tie to artwork is a series of studies that fall under what's now being very recent studies called perceptual fluency. And this is an idea that was suggested by an animal sexual selection researcher, Tamara Mendelssohn, and um, an, art, an artist in France, um, Julian Renault. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. So what they, the argument that they make is that our eyes evolved to process certain natural scenes, certain shapes in the environment. And I'm going to give you an example um, that doesn't have to do with beauty, but people analyze the numbers of shapes that you see in the environment from natural scenes. This is a group from Caltech. And what you find is that certain shapes are more common than other shapes, not a surprise. Then they analyzed the forms of letters in 23 different written languages across the planet. And what they found is very high congruence between the shapes of letters and the frequency of similar shapes in the natural environment. So what this person, Changaizi, suggested is that our eyes evolved to extract information from the environment. So it's very sensitive to different shapes. And those are the shapes that we end up using when we, quote unquote, we invent written languages. Now, this idea of perceptual fluency is similar. It suggests that certain statistics in portrait paintings are more similar, are, are motivated by the kinds of um, things that we deal with in nature. And what they make this very interesting argument is that if you analyze a lot of the details of these portraits, such as you know distance from eye to nose, from nose to chin, et cetera, they actually don't, they actually don't match onto exactly what a human face looks like, but they tend to deviate a bit and they tend to deviate towards what, the, what these researchers call natural scenes. So the argument is that artists are manipulating their, their paintings, their works of art to take advantage of what we, what we as humans have evolved to see in nature. And, this, and there's, lots of, there's lots of examples of this. Um, this isn't my field, so I'm not, certainly not an expert on it. But um, people have now shown that patterns of fishes tend to resemble patterns in their habitat. So fishes that live in areas where there's lots of uh, vertical vegetation are going to evolve certain kinds of patterns, whereas fishes that live in environments you know, that are mostly small stones or rocks are going to evolve, are going to evolve others. So this is a brand new fee, this is a brand new uh, suggestion for animal studies, only a couple of years, a few years old. And it falls within what is another interesting field called neuroaesthetics. So there's lots of neurobiologists now trying to understand human aesthetics. You know, so what is it about our brains, about our cognitive systems that make us find um, different faces, different works of art? More, more beautiful than others. Thank you very much, thank you. So, so uh, I was uh, just, uh, uh, just a question. So, uh, well, um, the evolutionary processes are uh, very, uh, on, they are, uh, they are taking place on large uh, time scale. But uh, taking into account also cognitive processes and maybe some epigenetic changes or, or those kind of uh, uh, proce other processes, 
do you think that the 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 perceptions that that the animals receive, for example, uh, during their lifespan for a couple of generations, could actually shape uh, their preferences, their uh, sexual preferences. For example, if you would uh, breed uh, uh, frogs for several generations in aquarium, and then and 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 letting them, uh, you know, like showing them different calls, do you think that could change? Well, I mean, like, this is not, uh, it, it's kind of heresy, but do you think that the the percepts uh, per se could change uh, uh, actually the the organic forms? I mean, like, it's, yeah. It's no, the, I, I, th I think you're exactly right. Um, and different, animals are going to be different. So for instance, we've done this experiment with the frogs. We've raised them hearing the call of their own species versus hearing the uh, call of a different species versus hearing traffic noise. And what we find with the frogs, with this species of frogs, that it seems to be very genetically hardwired. It doesn't, in, the males call just the same, the females have the same preferences. But we also know that, uh, for instance, with these sword-tailed fishes, if you expose females only to the odors of a different species, and then if you do the mate choice experiments between her own species and this different species, she does have a stronger attraction to the other species. It's not necessarily stronger than to her own, but it's much stronger than it would be um, in other situations. We know that birds, you know, the, the zebra finches that I showed, they have these red or orange beaks. And the young learn to discriminate between males and females by the color of the beaks of their parents. So we know that there's, you know, that there's real important learning, uh, learning that goes on there. So I think, you know, I think for sure in many, many species, this isn't. Um, these preferences are very susceptible to social and environmental effects. And it's not, you know, a single genetic hardwired preference that never evolves. And I'll just give you one, one final example. There's a group in Stockholm uh, working on guppies. And what they've done is they've selected some lines for guppies to have large brains and some lines in guppies to have small brains. If I'm remembering the, the study correctly, it only, in only about seven generations, you get these big differences. And then when you do these mate choice experiments, you find that the big brain females have these strong preferences for brighter colors, but the small brain females just made it random. They don't, they don't show these same color preferences. Exactly the same species, but you know, different brain sizes. Thank you very much. So, uh, if there are no more uh, questions, well, uh, only last question, my last question. I'm sorry for, <laughs> but uh, so uh, th there is this uh, uh, a theory of honest signaling that the signals actually uh, carry some message. But uh, if 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 the the signals would be only uh, adaptations to pre-existing sensory biases, is there any place for the 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 signal carrying uh, an informative message about it's better, or is it just like a, a trigger for uh, for the for the species? Yeah. So there. Um... At one point, the only hypothesis to explain these female preferences was this reliable signal, this uh, good genes. And usually the idea is that for these signals is that it reliably advertises to the female the male's genetic quality for survivorship. And this was also called the handicap principle. There's not a lot, that, that idea has been around for decades and there's just not a lot of support for it. It probably, it certainly seems to happen sometimes, but it doesn't seem to be as important as folks once thought it was. But 
there clearly are reliable signals. So the most reliable signal would be the signal that identifies what species you are. So there's no question about that, that that's a reliable signal and it's under strong selection to stay reliable. Then there's other, then there's other reliable signals that do suggest that um, females can get an advantage from so for example, if um, in some species of birds, the males with brighter colors are also better father, uh, pr provide more care to the offspring. So that would be an instance, an instance where there is, uh, you know, there is reliable information. Even in the tungra frogs, the females prefer to mate with the larger males and they can tell the male signs by listening to the pitch of that chuck syllable. And by mating with larger males, they get more, they have more offspring fertilized. So there are lots, of, there are, uh, there are examples of these honest signals, reliable signals, but they're probably working along with these sensory biases. Probably there's a lot, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of interaction between those two and they don't need to be mutually exclusive. 